here we are again, hearing words of wisdom, let it be in the wisdom factory. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the Wisdom Factory, a forum for open-minded people like you and us uh, who, who have knowledge and experience and wisdom to share with the world. Uh, I'm Mark Davenport. And I'm Heidi Hörnlein. And uh, our topics cover many areas of human experience. We invite people who not only have interesting things to say about their topics and their lives, but who also have an evolved perspective on themselves and what they're doing. Uh, they all feel inspired to contribute to a better world by helping people to better understanding and perspective on what is happening, both in their lives and in their world, and what they can contribute to the resolution of the many problems we're facing at this moment in history. Yeah, and today you are watching the 14th episode of the Wisdom Factory, which is entitled The Science of Possibility, and our special guest is John Freeman. But before we introduce our guests, some words about us, mm -hmm. your hosts. Yeah. We have created the Wisdom Factory show because we want to bring out into the world our knowledge and our experience, the things we have learned and that have opened our vision of the world and what it is all about. And we both were attracted by integral theory many, many years ago, and that has deeply, deeply changed our mm -hmm. lives. Professionally, we are counselors and coaches, mm -hmm. and especially for creating thriving relationships. And we run an association, cultural association, and a retreat in the guest house, which is called Paradiso Integrale in Umbria, in Italy. And when you come by, you are very welcome to stop by. You bet. <laughs> now, about our guest today, uh, John Freeman. He's a writer, a trainer, a mentor with a background in organizational systems and change management, working with Spiral Dynamics Integral, SQ21, Spiritual Intelligence, Mesh Worship Working, and Conscious Capitalism. He's a director of the UK Center for Human Emergence. His book inclu books include uh, Future Money, Evolving Relationships with Our Finest, and today's focus, which is the science of possibility. He's been researching the material for this book for 25 years, I believe. So, so hello, a minimum. <laughs> minimum. <laughs> okay. All right, good. We are so glad that you are here and we can talk about this wonderful topic. You know, it's, it's the time where we need to access our possibilities. Mm -hmm. The first thing I would like to ask you, yeah, is um, Mark has written Spiral Dynamics. People who know Integral, they know a little bit what it is. And then he has uh, read SQ21. What is that? SQ21 is uh, that that's the particular version of spiritual intelligence uh, assessment and coaching mm -hmm. which Cindy Wigglesworth who's quite well known in the integral circles and yeah. uh, quite well quite highly praised by Ken among others mm -hmm. for this work so yes I'm a, a coach and a coach trainer okay. uh, in, in SQ21. Wonderful. Okay maybe you can t tell us a little bit more about that later. I, I still have the other thing mesh working. Mm -hmm. What is mesh working? Okay, well, mesh working, um, that's really the application of um, complexity thinking and um, sort of dynamic and flex flow of, uh, ways of looking at the world. Um, from my point of view, uh, particularly in uh, addressing organizations and how organization function needs to change. So if there are any people listening who've come across um, Frederick Lou's book on uh, cool. reinventing organizations, for instance, yeah. um, mesh working would be kind of one of the descriptions that you might use for the work 
for that kind of work. It's again in integral terms second you know it's second tier organization it's opening up moving from linear thinking to non-linear thinking and how you apply that to organizations. Yeah. Okay, good. So I see that Salisu Amber is in the audience, and you see is, is our guest is not showing up on screen in the film step only when he is talking because your lower third is so large. No, Sally, we are only on two computers, so the film strip is not visible. So he is only visible when he is talking. Mm -hmm. Okay. Technical stuff. Technical stuff. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But I'm still here. <laughs> yeah, that's good. That's even, good. Even if you can't be seen momentarily. Yeah. Still. And Sally, tell us if for some reason he is talking and you, you don't see him, then I have to, to do something to make him visible because uh, I am here the wizard. I can yeah. do everything. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> so the possibilities. Yeah. We have here the possibilities of a wonderful tool to come together and, you know, speak together, connect together face to face and this is Really, for me, it's ha. it is. Yeah, when it, when it works, especially. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> but it's not exactly what we want to talk about. No, that's not our topic for this evening. So let us uh, hear a little yeah. bit. Yeah. You ask him. You have read his book. Well, I did read it. Yes, <laughs> I did. Uh huh. You know, and uh, I was really struck by your deep, deep respect for science. You know, despite how it may be. <laughs> working out some of the time uh, or with with the people involved the institutions involved and so I I, I I you were talking to the choir in some respect in in as much as I really wanted to believe what you were saying so I wasn't hard to convince which is kind of unscientific in itself but I, I'm trusting you for the science so to speak and, and I, I did take a a little dive into one area that I personally had questions about and and that was uh, uh, your description of uh, homeopathy and how it worked uh, I was so it's been a question in my mind that I had never actually looked deeply into and so I was really impressed with how you explained both the theory of homeopathy and then going to that big step of even when a homeopathic remedy may be so diluted that there might not be a single molecule of the of the remedy in the dilution it still works you know and this is the kind of leap you know that your book makes with so many many of the uh, topics you discuss which i love to see because it's it's moving us out of this linear thinking. It's moving us into a world where things are interacting continually and information is flowing. Um, but I imagine this is quite a leap for many of the people watching our show. And I'm just wondering if you could explain a f an example or two of how this works in maybe homeopathy, but also in, in other areas. I think I'll, I'll step outside to the big picture that homeopathy is just one illustration of. Very good. Because the, the fundamental of the problem from the scientific point of view is our viewpoint of reality as being entirely material. And that affects just about everything. It certainly constrains science, and it's why science is absolutely brilliant at some things. I mean, you know, if we just look at the fact that we can talk together the way that we are, that is a huge ach achievement technically and scientifically, and everything that sits in the background of this that kind of supports uh, all of it is a phenomenal achievement. But there's a constriction in what science can see, and it's affecting its view of biology, it's affecting its view of uh, evolution and genetics, and physics itself uh, has also got itself into a bit of a mess because they've made some kind of accommodations in order to make stuff work, but they now can't get beyond that. 
and um, there's only a couple of physicists like Massim Haramayan who are able to see through that to what is real and true. So where, when you step outside of this being only a material universe, the first place people go to, and many people have gone to this place, is that um, they recognize, for instance, that ever since quantum theory was invented a hundred years ago, we've had, and, and since Einstein, we've had this understanding of an interchangeability between energy and matter. And so when people are into all the kind of alternative stuff that for science is outside the pale and um, distinctly woo-woo, mm -hmm. what they say is everything is energy. And that's both true and useless <laughs> in my per perception because it doesn't actually explain anything and it doesn't tell you what you can do with it or how you can do anything with it. And the central theme of the book is that there is, is answering the question, what is it that makes energy behave the way it does? What is it that makes energy form it in itself into matter as it does? And what is it that makes the world behave as it does in all the areas where um, things that we can't see are happening but which we may know are real or we, which at least some people are experiencing as, as real. Like for instance there are people who have psychic experiences or there have been you know the, the, there's traditions of shamanism and nature spirit uh, in relationships and so on that many people in this world that is part of their experienced reality and the reason those things are capable of being experienced as, as reality is that there is a relationship between us and who we are and the external world that happens in a non-material realm and that is conveyed by information and the information that is there is the, is the information that also is the root structuring process of the universe from the very point of its creation forward so that everything that the universe has ever done everything that the universe has built itself to be was a kind of um, a learning process a lot of people wonder why, how, how the universe magically kind of fulfills all these beautiful, beautiful, elegant formulae which science comes up with. Well, it didn't do that because there was some designer who said, oh, here's a beautiful formula, we'll design a universe that looks like that. It did it because the universe tried all the ones that weren't beautiful and elegant and didn't work, mm -hmm. and then it in the process it found the ones which did work and the information about what works is part of what the universe knows of itself and which structures the universe and from the very smallest particle through the development of atoms and molecules and amino acids and the complete structuring of the physical world that is something that the universe has built and which knows which it knows of itself and it includes a whole realm of connectivity where all that information is available now if you then bring that back to the biological level and to our consciousness we typically have the same problem of our material boundaries because we think of ourselves principally as I'm this kind of entity which is inside this bag of skin and we may get beyond that to the point where we can engage with the notion that we have consciousness and we can expand consciousness and be part of something that is bigger and that is consciousness mm -hmm. and lots of people do that 
but we exactly the, I mean this is now so very fashionable you know to talk about consciousness and expansion of consciousness new paradigm and what not so <laughs> can you well, explain exactly. that? but but it doesn't go all the way it's it's like it's 20 percent of the way of what's possible because when we don't recognize that what we think of as this boundary is not a boundary and it's not just that the it's not just our kind of brain waves or thoughts that are extending beyond that we are physically interacting there's there's however many let's say 40 trillion as a low estimate of how many cells there are in the body and every molecule in those cells has electrons and electrons are not stable they're passing in and out of the whole field and they're taking and receiving information and there's all sorts of, of mechanisms within the body which allow us to resonate with the detecting of the information which is passing to and fro and there's a whole you know there's, there's several chapters in the book about what me, what mediates that at the f level of physics and mm -hmm. I Can won't I ask you try and explain that, that. You just, are just a second but but okay. I want I want to make sure that people get this core concept that we are in permanent flow with the universe that we are the drop and the ocean all of the time and that it's not just taking place in in thought waves it's actually a physical process so that all of the information in the universe is potentially accessible to us okay mm -hmm. sorry yeah <laughs> I sort of forgotten now my language uh, my, my question it was about um, yeah, you, you talked about the invisible and that we still can can be in interaction with it. Isn't it, for instance, electromagnetic waves, yeah, the cell phone, this, this, this stuff, you know? You, you don't see it, but it's still influencing us. Is, is it that what you mean? Um, n well, n it, it's a bit more than that. I mean, yes, of course, we do, you know, we do... Uh, get affected by electromagnetic waves but the what I'm talking about is so far beyond that because electromagnetic waves they tend to be local right what I'm talking about potentially the relationship you have with the information in the universe has no limits you are perfectly capable because of the way that the information in the universe is connected in in the field of the universe the information field of the universe L let me give you an, il an illustration which was my original experience that started me on this path because I was trained very rationally and I didn't believe really that people could be psychic and I was in a course which I thought was just about kind of um, stress re reduction and things like that but which at the end of which I had an experience because they were trying to tra train people to detect illnesses in others psychically and I was given the information having been trained in the techniques of, of this over four days the information about a person and he was called David and he was 27 years old and he lived in Devon that was all I knew about him and I was expected as we all were in with different people we were all doing these exercises I was expected to detect what it was that David was suffering from and I was getting nothing tuning in and so on until I did a, a technique which is suggested where you kind of imagine you put the person on as a like a bodysuit and the minute I did that the second I did that I got this intense feeling in the back of my left left head the left part of my head and I kind of wanted to screw my face up and I said does this person have a brain tumor now if you take what does it take to to do that I mean that was the first time it was a mind-blowing experience and but since then you know I, I see this as just something we can do and I I became an intuition trainer with that technique and I trained other people to do it and I know it's replicable and we can all do it 
but what's kind of what matters about it is well what kind of universe has to exist for that to be possible mm -hmm. because what it says is that for instance that I can be asking a question with that minimal amount of information about the target I'm to connect with and I can connect with that target and having made that connection I can go into that space of information about what he's experiencing and I can have that be part of my knowing so there's no boundary of there's no boundary of space there's considerable doubt with this as whether there's a boundary of time either but let's stick with space that if you can do that potentially there is no limit to distance. I mean, he happened to be in the same country, but it could have been that he was on the other side of the world. And it's quite possible then if there's consciousnesses elsewhere in the universe, which are connected into this field of universal consciousness, that we can have an interaction with, with them, because all the information is there. And there is some form what, what it says is that there's kind of some form of cosmic addressing system mm -hmm. such that even though the amount of information that it would take to construct a universe is kind of inconceivably vast, that we can choose what we connect with and that we have um, mechanisms, if you like, within our our biology and our consciousness that allow us to do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what we've been doing with consciousness so far has kind of only been 20% of what's possible. And at the moment I'm talking about receiving, but then there's the next bit which is transmitting and influencing because mm -hmm. it goes both ways. Yeah. Can I first ask a question? I mean, this sounds a little bit, you know, for who is used to not believe these things and doubting all these things, it sounds a little bit like woo-woo. What is the difference between just believing and your science? You, you have based it on science. What is it that allows you to say that this is real? Well, there's lots and lots of... Um, examples in the book of the ways in which this shows up scientifically. One example I could use is there's a laboratory which existed at Princeton in their engineering uh, in their engineering uh, faculty which was um, it was called the Princeton Engineering Anomalies, Re Anomalies Research Laboratory and they spent um, over a decade having people sit in front of um, different kinds of apparatus including random number generators which would normally because they're random be 50 percent odd and 50 percent even in the numbers they generate and they had them psychically influencing the outcome to kind of push it towards being odd or even and they had consistent results with that. They also had a more physical version of, of that, which was a, a kind of a device that dropped ball bearings. And the way that they would drop, if left to the, its own devices, they would form this kind of bell shape. And again, they had people psychically influence the dropping of these ball bearings and push it either left or right over a period of time. Now the, the difference is that they can achieve a quite small but if if you were to look um, at the kind of the totality of the results what what, what the Professor Bob Yarn who, who was a you know senior NASA aeronautical engineer and a um, <laughs> not a woo-woo thinker by any means <laughs> when he talks about this he says that the odds against the results we have got over the years the odds against it are 12 trillion to one mm -hmm. 
So it's like a lot less likely even than, linear, than winning the lottery that this should happen by chance. It's so that's that's one of the examples I like to use of things which actually you can see as scientific fact and that show as a result and it also answers the question that Carla is asking which is it says can our thoughts influence the universe well yes it can they can of course the influence is a very subtle but if you combine the knowledge that you can create subtle influences and the knowledge of what happens in unstable systems when you have a perturbation which which is kind of within chaos theory and what people know as the butterfly effect mm -hmm. that you can have a very if you have an unstable system and you kind of hit the energy in such a way as to cause ripples outwards from a small effect you can have it where the butterfly wing flap causes whatever it is a typhoon in 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 Japan or so we have the potential from our own consciousness but people have always known this in in a sense they've known it from within and they've tried to do it by you know originally they would sacrifice to the power gods or they would pray to the external divine in the whole the concept of, of you know Christian or uh, other um, uh, sort of other theistic religions so there's always been this notion and there's lots of people who've been doing creative visualization and, or, and building vision boards and whatever in, in kind of new age and new thought and this all speaks it's not a fantasy it speaks to something that somewhere we know deeply but we haven't actually been very good at it because until we completely embrace the fact that we are the drop in the ocean and that we're fully in there we have this sense of kind of we're asking something that's outside of us when actually the true what I think of as conscious creation 2.0 if all those other things were conscious creation 1 that conscious creation 2.0 is what happens when we learn about how to fully be in the oneness with the creation so that the creation is in us that we are the drop and in the ocean and that there is a seamless process and when we know it, my experience is that when that knowing the truth of reality and the nature of our consciousness in connection when we take it beyond just being a kind of a a thought field thing that we can play with and have a passive experience with when we know that reality when we know that boundaryless boundarylessness that we can fully enter into the potency of that creative possibility and how can we learn to to know that hmm. well this is something I'm going to be um, doing much more of over the next uh, next year is to start kind of putting out how this is done I mean it, it's taken it's taken a long time to even get to the point where I can express what the f what the openness in the field of possibility is um, and to kind of map out this is this is why and how but the core of how we do it um, it goes beyond th there are sort of two levels because lots of people have been sort of working with eliminating the negative thoughts and all of that mm -hmm. and that's kind of that's kind of there but actually it's also at the same time slightly relevant because the more you enter into the beingness of it the less we, the less the thoughts matter. We have such a huge over emphasis in our respect for our logical rational minds. And I mean, I say this as someone who's spent all his life living very fundamentally in my rational mind, and yet the more I learn, the more 
I'm aware of how how limited it is and how when it comes to manifesting what we really want in the world it's a kind of it's a chocolate coffee pot it doesn't really do the job <laughs> um, yeah. and so <laughs> you're speaking so it's finding this body this body mind wisdom this inner knowing this intuitive space which is so outside the limit outside of the linear controlled reality that it's really tough for most of us because we're so well trained in the linear controlled reality. I'm I, I starting to see you coming away from the, the tight controlled logical thought by thought explanation of what how this works and, and growing into a kind of uh, rapturous feeling. I can imagine you actually exploding in delight <laughs> as, as you consider all of these possibilities. And I'm sure you've had those experiences. And uh, these are things, of course, that we all crave, you know? These are, these are things we all want. But we also have experience up to a certain extent, yes, at least in my own experience. I Up to 10 years ago, I thought only, you know, I live in my head. I didn't know that there was another place. And then you learn to live in your heart, but there seems to be still another there's place more, to, there's more. to be. Yeah. And this is so interesting. It's so, you know, while you are speaking, I'm so... <gasps> Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. And and please explode if you want. It's wonderful. <laughs> I what a whatever I who knows I might yes. Um, I mean you I mentioned the heart. I mean, this journey into the heart is an important one. I wanted yeah. only recognize that it's Robin Wood in our audience. Hi, Robin. It's so nice that you are here with us. Hello. Robin. And then there's Carla, as you already said. And then there is Kristen Drister. At least these are the ones who have done a comment so far. There must be more because I see it. So yeah. <laughs> please ask your questions, write your comments. Yeah. Uh, John will answer. So, I'm very, very happy to take questions because it always kind of stimulates something which, um, which is not kind of planned. I wanted to respond to your, to what you said about heart, because, for instance, one of the scientific things that um, is kind of counter to what most people have been told is, you know, the, the conventional medical thing would be the heart is just a pump, but actually. It's not. It's a, it's um, it's a device, if you can call it that, which sends more information to the brain than it receives from the brain, and it's got its own field of um, of electromagnetics, and it's doing all sorts of things which are synchronizing the rhythms of the body, and holding the body in the kind of um, space where when we settle into that knowing, the resonances between the, our body world, that to kick in more. That's where we get outside our head. So all of the wonderful work that you and millions of other people have been doing to get into the heart and to the body wisdom, that's part of the preparation, what's near in the place where we can explore the connectivity uh, to its to its full, mm -hmm. and there are many 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 other routes of connectivity in the body too, which most of us don't know anything about. We've but barely it, scratched the, the surface. Yeah. yeah. That's wonderful. Would you like to tell us something else, which is you know, which we cannot imagine, but you have found out that is real. Mm. To become, to become a little bit more down to earth in the sense to <laughs> <laughs> concrete, <laughs> to concretize things a bit. Mm -hmm. oh. Okay. Um, well, I think this is pretty down to earth, and it's another personal experience which was um, pretty important to to me, and it came a maybe a couple of years after I originally had that uh, psychic event. Because the organization I became 
involved with, uh, which is called Silver Mind Control, who taught that, you know, which, which developed that course, also had a hands-on healing process. And at the time I was doing this, um, and at the time I went to the to, to train in the hands-on healing methodology, it was the time when AIDS was becoming very, um, you know, the big the big scare. Nobody knew what it was, how it was happening. We didn't really know how to deal with it. But um, I was in a the, the, in the training alongside um, some some guys from the gay community who were very very concerned about it and who wanted to experiment with using the hands-on healing processes with people they knew who were in hospital and really sick. And so we kind of formed a, a, a group and uh, developed a, a protocol plan for how we would work and that we, there would be three healers who would go in at a time and we planned to go in three times a day and do these um, processes which at that time had to be actually hands off because we uh, this was before they knew what the transmission mechanisms were the first um, first person with AIDS that we worked with at the point where uh, the group engaged with him this is a guy of six foot two and he was down to about a hundred pounds in weight and his family, um, he, he, he was not conscious and his family had called in the uh, priest to administer the last rites, which had he been conscious, <laughs> he would have not liked at all. <laughs> so the team, and I wasn't within, I wasn't with the team that was working in the first week, but they went in and started doing you know, three hours a day and at the end of the first week, he was once again um, conscious and alert. After two weeks, I went in in the team in the second week. After two weeks, um, he was able to get out of bed and take himself to the bathroom. After four weeks of this regime, he um, left the hospital. And at that point, he'd been tested and there was no trace of HIV in his body. Four weeks of, okay, very intense healing, but when th that for me is possibly even bigger and more potent in what that meant for me experientially as compared with the first psychic event, because what that says in terms of there being no limits to what we can do in the healing realm it, when we're working within energy and consciousness and we you know there's a lot more that we would be able to do now a lot more that's that people are working with now that you know the people who are, are working um, for instance in in access consciousness and doing the, the forms of healing they're doing are way more advanced than what we were doing then there's something that is possible when we engage with each other's field of both body consciousness and kind of emotional, mental, um, and and the, the the field of our awareness. There's something that becomes possible that is so far ahead of anything that we currently think is we could do that 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 for me is very that's very concrete and real I mean I'm talking 30 years ago that this happened so um, and, and I, you know I've got plenty of things I've seen since but in a way that was the most that was the most dramatic mm -hmm. and the most evidenced I mean most of the things that I know of that have happened they don't have at the end of it something which says yes the doctors did all the blood tests and you know found that the HIV was gone Right. Now, that is amazing. I'm sure very, very convincing, too. And I, I'm a concrete example from your own experience. And I want to take you in the other direction. Wait a minute, wait a wait minute. Wait a minute. I would like to know oh. still, what, what was this healing like? What did you actually do in the healing groups? And then okay. you can go somewhere else. Okay. 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 <laughs> okay. Um, well, the, the two main 
elements in it were, were one was a sort of a, a, a creative visualization meditation process which um, once he was conscious or possibly before he was conscious he was able to engage with his own healing from um, that inner space and the rest was kind of just we're going to deliver energy we're going to deliver healing energy there was no um, there was no finesse to it. I mean, it, and it's not different than what people do in Reiki. I mean, there's, you know, how many people are Reiki trained? I imagine you know, millions and millions. So, very simple techniques. Very simple techniques. Okay, so uh, you can go in a minute. Uh, I <laughs> <laughs> wanted to know, you know, there is so much, this is not mainstream at all. I've heard in England before hands-on was even in the hospital possible and now they have even abolished that. Is it right? I don't know. So it seems even that there is less confidence in that things like that happen or is it some interest? Play? I couldn't really say. I don't have the knowledge of what's what 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 is allowable in hospitals. I know there's been a big la backlash against um, homeopathy, and I, um, yeah, you know, I, I really don't want to talk about the whole kind of you know pharmaceutical purchase of of um, research uh, and and the influence of of that. But th th that to me is it's it's a bit of a, a tragedy. Um, so, no, I don't know what's allowable in hospitals. I suspect it depends very much on the hospital. Of course, at the time we did this, when when it came to dealing with AIDS, it's like, well, you can do what you like, it won't work anyway, and why should we care? Yeah. <laughs> so, so we had a huge amount of license, in a sense, which came from the conditions of, of, of the time. Yeah. Um, even that we were allowed to, to, you know, three people around a, a, a bed three, for three hours a day. Mm -hmm. um, you know that, that that would be an issue. So yes, that's okay. Okay, now you can fly is it, is it into my your time heart. now. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, go, going from these concrete, specific examples, I want to touch back to something you said earlier in the show about the 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 lack of importance of space in so many of these considerations, and you hinted at maybe of time also. So I, I, I invite you to, you know, if you don't have scientific evidence, can you speculate a little about how that might work, moving, you know, independently of time? Okay, well the evidence that's, that's there is not scientifically strong in, in terms of kind of um, having external validation, but there there are a good number of accounts um, from various areas of people who've been able to do precognition and there's a um, Major Hames who, who, is, uh, who, who is kind of ex-US military and worked in some of their kind of more um, esoteric areas uh, certainly has produced evidence of, of war um, illustrations of that. My favorite actually comes from a book by um, he's another aeronautical uh, scientist except this is uh, he, he dates back to the 1920s so the kind of planes he was dealing with were rather simpler but he was a scientist who happened at some point to have a, d a dream which was precognitive and which he, which something happened a few days later that he knew had, you know, this dream was telling it was a um, uh, a railway accident, where he he'd he dreamed of the the of of a, a train coming off the tracks and rolling down an embankment, and he'd seen the scene and the location where this happened, and he subsequently his name's J W Dunn and and because he was a physicist he actually wrote a book which is half full of the illustrations that he got from himself and from other people who he started to collect examples from and the other half of the book is full of some very um, advanced mathematics where he relates everything that he was doing back to 
what Einstein was re had recently brought out in terms of relativity theory. So it's this wonderful com combination, that, and he writes in this kind of very elegant Victorian gentleman style. There, there's, there's something beautifully authentic about it, which I really like. Um, so yeah, there's not a huge amount out there, and it's probably just as well, I think maybe for our sanity, that um, most of the time, for the moment, time does seem to be pretty linear and we and we can kind of still relate to that but it's nice to have that sense of possibility of okay where might this go oh sure wonderful mm -hmm. yes sort of Robin. out of time oh do we have to stop yeah. here sort oh, of oh yeah. Robin would get something oh yeah let us see there is Robin saying I believe Einstein and other genie were consciously accessing this field of possibility for me, this is one way of explaining the possibilities. I also experienced through my connection, John speaks of, does he also find this an inspiration? Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I mean, w one of the things I've loved about this whole journey is that the more I, you know, the more I do and the more I investigate, the, wi <laughs> the wider the possibilities seem to get. You know, it's, it's like it, it just feels limitless. Uh -huh. So what spiritual teachers say, we have infinite possibilities, you sort of, from the side of science, you come to mm -hmm. sort of prove it? Mm -hmm. Well, I think it would be really nice if science would recognize the reality that the spiritual teachers have known for a long time. And, of course, you know, the, typically, historically, the spiritual teachers have tended to be in the mystical and passive mode, mm -hmm. but the spiritual teachers that are coming and that will come in the future will be the ones who, un who, who engage even more with this kind of active creative possibility that sits with our, uh, our consciousness. And, and there are some of those out there already. Mm -hmm. How oh, it's very exciting to be alive now. <laughs> yes. And Absolutely. We we have to stop soon. Yeah, we we, have. we should ask him what's coming up, though. Yes. Give him a chance. What are you planning doing in the future? What can you? Where can you invite people to go? You, by your book, probably. Okay. Well, um, by all means, those who who would like to kind of know the depth underneath and and who aren't put off by the word science, um, by all means, look uh, look for the science of possibility. It's on Amazon and on Kindle and all the usual things. What's coming is um, keep your eyes open for Conscious Creation 2.0 because that will be coming sometime this year I think. We're, we're kind of In case people didn't putting the pro program together that will... Sorry? I, I, you, you broke up a little bit when you mentioned uh, Consciousness two, Conscious Creation, creation 2.0. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. All right. And if people want to, you know, want to make sure they're let know of, of that, if you um, send me an email at well at, at john at johnfreeman.co.uk or john at sciencepossibility.net, either of those will work. There's a little bit more stuff, including a short video clip on. There's a short video clip on the Science of Possibility site, of uh, which shows the pair PAR experiments. So you can actually get a bit more of a feel than my description, and you see Bob Yarn actually talking about this 12 trillion to one thing. So there's a couple of things on that site which might uh, entertain people. Okay. Very nice. And in the meantime, I think we can tell ourselves and tell our watchers that we can always consciously create our lives and yes, our yes, we future. Can. Also, we don't really know how it works scientifically yet, 100%, but there is evidence that we can, and we have the power to do that. Yeah. Right. Exactly. That would be my message. Good. <laughs> you? The final word? Oh, gosh. I, I'm just so thrilled that uh, this kind of information is is finding its way out, and we are so pleased to be able to be a part of of enabling that to come out. It, it, it fills us with joy. Absolutely, mm -hmm. this is our heart purpose. Yes, yeah. <laughs> 
really? uh, it's great that you're doing it. It's lovely to have places to come and talk about this stuff. Mm. <laughs> we will continue. This will be, we still have two episodes in the Wisdom Factory, the first um, how do, is it called season and then we will have another season in May June uh, coming up and stay tuned everybody yeah. and thank you all in the audience who have been here with us I saw there was also Cindy <laughs> and who was there without being Without, visible. Yes. Who was <laughs> you invisible? You're welcome to and thank you for watching and to you John Thanks so much. Thanks so much. You have really made my day, my evening. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's so well, thank you. it's, it's yes. been a total pleasure. It's wonderful. Thank you and bye-bye. Bye-bye. With it or how you can do anything with it. And the central theme of the book is that there is, is answering the question what is it that makes energy behave the way it does? What is it that makes energy form it in itself into matter as it does? And what is it that makes the world behave as it does in all the areas where um, things that we can't see are happening, but which we may know are real or at we, at which at least some people are experiencing as as real like for instance there are people who have psychic experiences or there have been you know the, 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 there's traditions of shamanism and nature spirits uh, in relationships and so on that many people in this world that is part of their experienced reality and the reason those things are capable of being experienced as, as reality is that there is a relationship between us and who we are and the external world that happens in a non-material realm and that is conveyed by information. And the information that is there is the, is the information that also is the root structuring process of the universe from the very point of its creation forward. So that everything that the universe has ever done, everything that the universe has built itself to be, was a kind of um, a learning process. A lot of people wonder why, how, how the universe magically kind of fulfills all these beautiful, beautiful, elegant formulae which science comes up with. Well, it didn't do that because there was some designer who said, oh, here's a beautiful formula, we'll design a universe that looks like that. It did it because the universe tried all the ones that weren't beautiful and elegant and didn't work, mm -hmm. and then it in the process it found the ones which did work and the information about what works is part of what the universe knows of itself and which structures the universe and from the very smallest particle through the development of atoms and molecules and amino acids and the complete structuring of the physical world that is something that the universe has built and which knows which it knows of itself and it includes a whole realm of connectivity where all that information is available now if you then bring that back to the biological level and to our consciousness we typically have the same problem of our material boundaries because we think of ourselves principally as I'm this kind of entity which is inside this bag of skin and we may get beyond that to the point where we can engage with the notion that we have consciousness and we can expand consciousness and be part of something that is bigger and that is consciousness mm -hmm. and lots of people it's been a question in my mind that I had never actually looked deeply into and so I was really impressed with how you explained both the theory of homeopathy and then going to that big step of even when a homeopathic remedy may be so diluted 
that there might not be a single molecule of the of the remedy in the dilution it still works you know and this is the kind of leap you know that your book makes with so many many of the uh, topics you discuss which i love to see because it's it's moving us out of this linear thinking it's moving us into a world where things are interacting continually and information is flowing um, but I imagine this is quite a leap for many of the people watching our show and I'm just wondering if you could explain a f an example or two of how this works in maybe homeopathy but also in, in other areas I think I'll, I'll step outside to the big picture that homeopathy is just one illustration of very good because the the fundamental of the problem from the scientific point of view is our viewpoint of reality as being entirely material and that affects just about everything it certainly constrains science and it's why science is absolutely brilliant at some things I mean you know if we just look at the fact that we can talk together the way that we are that is a huge achievement technically and scientifically and everything that sits in the background of this that kind of supports uh, all of it is a phenomenal achievement but there's a constriction in what science can see and it's affecting its view of biology it's affecting its view of uh, evolution and genetics and physics itself uh, has also got itself into a bit of a mess because they've made some kind of accommodations in order to make stuff work but they now can't get beyond that and um, there's only a couple of physicists like Massim Haramayan who are able to see through that to what is real and true so where when you step outside of this being only a material universe the first place people go to and many people have gone to this place is that um, they recognize for instance that ever since quantum theory was invented a hundred years ago we've had and, and since Einstein we've had this understanding of an interchangeability between energy and matter and so when people are into all the kind of alternative stuff that for science is outside the pale and um, distinctly woo-woo mm -hmm. what they say is everything is energy and that's both true and useless <laughs> in my per perception because it doesn't actually explain anything and it doesn't tell you what you can do here we are again hearing words of wisdom let it be in the wisdom factory <laughs> hello and welcome to the wisdom factory a forum for open-minded people like you and us uh, who, who have knowledge and experience and wisdom to share with the world uh, I'm Mark Davenport and I'm Heidi Hörnlein and uh, our topics cover many areas of human experience we invite people who not only have interesting things to say about their topics and their lives but who also have an evolved perspective on themselves and what they're doing uh, they all feel inspired to contribute to a better world by helping people to better understanding and perspective on what is happening both in their lives and in their world and what they can contribute to the resolution of the many problems we're facing at this moment in history yeah and today you are watching the 14th episode of the Wisdom Factory which is entitled The Science of Possibility and our special guest is John Freeman but before we introduce our guest some words about us mm -hmm. your host well. we have created the Wisdom Factory show because we want to bring out into the world 
our knowledge and our experience, the things we have learned and that have opened our vision of the world and what it is all about. And we both were attracted by integral theory many, many years ago, and that has deeply, deeply changed our lives. Mm -hmm. Professionally, we are counselors and coaches, mm -hmm. and especially for creating thriving relationships. And we run an association, cultural association, and a retreat in the guest house, which is called Paradiso Integrale in Umbria, in Italy. And when you come by, you are very welcome to stop by. You bet. <laughs> now, about our guest today, uh, John Freeman. He's a writer, a trainer, a mentor with a background in organizational systems and change management, working with Spiral Dynamics Integral, SQ21, Spiritual Intelligence, Mesh Worship Working, and Conscious Capitalism. He's a director of the UK Center for Human Emergence. His book inclu books include uh, Future Money, Evolving Relationships with Our Finest, and today's focus, which is the science of possibility. He's been researching the material for this book for 25 years, I believe. So, so that's a minimum. <laughs> minimum. <laughs> okay. All right, great. We're so glad that you are here and we can talk about this wonderful topic. You know, it's, it's the time where we need to access our possibilities. Mm -hmm. The first thing I would like to ask you, yeah, is um, Mark has written Spiral Dynamics. People who know Integral, they know a little bit what it is. And then he has uh, read SQ21. What is that? SQ21 is uh, that that's the particular version of spiritual intelligence. Uh, assessment and coaching which Cindy Wigglesworth who's quite well known in the integral circles and yeah. uh, quite well quite highly praised by Ken among others mm -hmm. for this work so yes I'm a, a coach and a coach trainer okay. uh, in, in SQ21. Wonderful. Okay maybe you can t tell us a little bit more about that later. I, I still have the other thing mesh working. Mm -hmm. What is mesh working? Okay, well, mesh working, um, that's really the application of um, complexity thinking and um, sort of dynamic and flex flow of, uh, ways of looking at the world. Um, from my point of view, uh, particularly in uh, addressing organizations and how organization function needs to change. So if there are any people listening who've come across um, Frederick Lou's book on uh, cool. reinventing organizations, for instance, yeah. um, mesh working would be kind of w one of the descriptions that you might use for the work, th for that kind of work. It's, again, in integral terms, second, you know, it's second tier organization. It's opening up, moving from linear thinking to non-linear thinking and how you apply that to organizations. Yeah. That's okay. Good. Good. So I see that Sally Sue Amber is in the audience and you see is, is our guest is not showing up on screen in the film step only when he's talking because your lower third is so large. No, Sally, we are only on two computers so the film strip is not visible. So he is only visible when he is talking. Mm -hmm. Okay? Technical stuff. Technical stuff. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm still here. <laughs> yeah, that's good. That's e good. Even if you can't be seen momentarily. Yeah. Still. And Sally, tell us if for some reason he is talking and you, you don't see him, then I have to, to do something to make him visible because right. I am here the wizard. I can yeah. do everything. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> so the possibilities. Yeah. We have here the possibilities of a wonderful tool to come together and, you know, speak together, connect together face to face and this is really for me it's ha. it is. Yeah. When it, when it works especially. Yeah. Yes. Okay. But it's not exactly what we want to talk about. No, that's not our topic for this evening. So let us hear a little yeah. bit. Yeah. You ask him. You have read his book. Well, I so. did read it. Yes, <laughs> I did. Uh-huh. You know, and uh, 
I was really struck by your deep, deep respect for science, you know, despite how it may be <laughs> working out some of the time uh, or with, with the people involved, the institutions involved. And so I, 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 you were talking to the choir in some respect in, in as much as I really wanted to believe what you were saying. So I wasn't hard to convince which is kind of unscientific in itself, but I, I'm trusting you for the science, so to speak. And, and I, I did take a, a little dive into one area that I personally had questions about, and and that was uh, uh, your description of uh, homeopathy and how it worked. Uh, I was so... Do that. But we... Yeah. Exactly. I mean, this is now so very fashionable, you know, to talk about consciousness and expansion of consciousness, new paradigm and what not. So, <laughs> can you well, explain exactly. that? But, but it doesn't go all the way. It's, it's like it's 20% of the way of what's possible. Because when we don't recognize that what we think of as this boundary is not a boundary and it's not just that the it's not just our kind of brain waves or thoughts that are extending beyond that we are physically interacting there's there's however many let's say 40 trillion as a low estimate of how many cells there are in the body and every molecule in those cells has electrons and electrons are not stable they're passing in and out of the whole field and they're taking and receiving information and there's all sorts of, of mechanisms within the body which allow us to resonate with the detecting of the information which is passing to and fro and there's a whole you know there's, there's several chapters in the book about what me, what mediates that at the f level of physics and mm -hmm. I Can won't I ask you try and explain that, that. You just, are just a second, but but okay. I want I want to make sure that people get this core concept that we are in permanent flow with the universe, that we are the drop and the ocean all of the time, and that it's not just taking place in in thought waves. It's actually a physical process, so that all of the information in the universe is potentially accessible to us. Mm -hmm. Okay, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> I sort of forgotten now my language. Uh, my my question. It was about um, yeah. You you talked about the invisible and that we still can can be in interaction with it. Isn't it, for instance, electromagnetic waves? Yeah, the cell phone. This the, the stuff. You know, you you don't see it, but it's still influencing us. Is is it that what you mean? Um, well. It, it's a bit more than that. I mean, yes, of course, we do. You know, we do uh, get affected by electromagnetic waves, but the what I'm talking about is so far beyond that because electromagnetic waves they tend to be local, right? What I'm talking about potentially the relationship you have with the information in the universe has no limits you are perfectly capable because of the way that the information in the universe is connected in in the field of the universe the information field of the universe L let me give you an, an illustration which was my original experience that started me on this path because I was trained very rationally and I didn't believe really that people could be psychic and I was in a course which I thought was just about kind of um, stress re reduction and things like that, but which, at the end of which, I had an experience because they were trying to tra train people to detect